think we may sit. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Banda, for those uh, very kind words. Uh, but program director and distinguished leaders of the Center for Policy Dialogue and the Kenneth Counter Children of Africa Foundation uh, and the dear members of the Counter family, uh, distinguished participants, members of the press, comrades, uh, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I'd like to thank the Kenneth Kaunda Children of Africa Foundation and the Center for Policy Dialogue for the honor extended to me to deliver this first Kenneth Kaunda Memorial Lecture. I say this because, as has been said, I had the great privilege of spending almost two decades in this great African city and country constantly exposed to President Kaunda's leadership. I'm therefore acutely aware of the, of the reality that I will be speaking today of an outstanding African patriot who was, to the end of his life, my own leader. Yeah. A few days after President Kaunda passed away, yeah. Juan Emmanuel Mensah Abludo on the 26th of June last year caused the publication in a Nigerian newspaper at the Premium Times of an obituary entitled Kenneth Kaunda, The Last African Liberation Giant Goes Home. And the obituary said, barely a week ago, the last of the giants of the African liberation struggle in the past century, Kenneth David Kaunda, Zambian president, finished his earthly journey. He joined the ancestors at an advanced age of 97 <coughs> at a military hospital in the Zambian capital, Lusaka. Mr. Kaunda was admitted on Monday, June 14, 2021, suffering from pneumonia and he passed on on the 17th of June. And he said, when the soul of the non-Nigerian freedom fighter, Dr. Kaunda, passed to the mercy of God on that fateful day, the shock waves of the news of his passing left many with sadness and teary eyes in the African homeland specifically and across the world. And from north to south and from east to west, tributes poured in for the statesman described as the last giant of 20th, 20th century African nationalism. As citizens of the world, as citizens of the world, we have to emulate uh, Kaunda's sacrifice, his courage, his candor, his supportive attitude, his perseverance his nationalistic fervor, and above all, the pursuit of truth on all fronts, while vigorously fighting misinformation and disinformation at every, at every level. And we pray that the soul of the late, late Kenneth Kaunda continue to have a peaceful repose in the Lord till we meet again in company of Kwame Nkrumah, Abu Bakr Tafawa Balewa, Namdi Azikiwe, Julius Nyerere, Ahmed Sekuture, and others, adieu. That's the end of that obituary. And thus does this moving obituary to our beloved leader KK refer to some other African patriots who were his peers. And this brings to mind an historic process of which all of these leaders were the product. And I refer here to the series of Pan-African Congresses, which started in 1900. 
bringing together Africans on the continent and the African diaspora. And in this regard, we must recall the famous words which came from that 1900 First Pan-African Congress held in London, England. And in a message entitled to the nations of the world, that conference said, in the metropolis of the modern world, in this, the closing year of the 19th century, there has been assembled a Congress of men and women of African blood to deliberate solemnly upon the present situation and outlook of the darker races of mankind. And it said, the problem of the 20th century, I'm sure all of us will recall these words, that the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. The question as to how far differences of race, which show themselves chiefly in the color of the skin and the texture of the hair, will hereafter be made the basis of denying to over half the world the right of sharing to the utmost ability the opportunities and privileges of modern civilization." Unquote. This was the message of men and women of African blood to the nations of the world as the 20th century into which KK was born began, that the problem of the century was the problem of the color line. And that same message also said, among other things, let not the natives of Africa be sacrificed to the greed of gold their liberties taken away, their family life debauched, their just aspirations repressed, and avenues of advancement and culture taken from them. And let not the cloak of Christian missionary enterprise be, allow be allowed in the future, as so often in the past, to, hi <clears throat> to hide the ruthless economic exploitation and political downfall of less developed nations, whose chief fault has been reliance on the, on the, blighted, on the blighted faith of the Christian church." Unquote. And in its message, that message, the 1900 Pan-African Congress of men and women of African blood held out this hope for the future. In any case, the modern world must remember that in this age, when the ends of the world are being brought together by the millions of black men in Africa, America, and the islands of the sea, not to speak of the brown and yellow myriads elsewhere, we are bound to have a great influence upon the world in the future by reason of sheer numbers and physical contact." Unquote. I've been talking about words spoken by Africans in 1900, which provided the frame basis on which Kenneth Kaunda and his peers stood as they engaged in political struggle 50 years later in the 1950s. And some of KK's peers mentioned in the obituary we have just cited, like the great Kwame Nkrumah, participated in the very important 1945 Fifth Pan-African Congress. And the importance of that Congress derives in particular from the assertion that is correctly made that first, those who gathered in Manchester, England in 1945, in that year's Pan-African Congress, were legitimate successor to the men and women of African blood who had convened in London, England in 1900. And second, that many of those, those who went from the Congress, that's the fifth Pan-African Congress, they moved, moved from that Congress straight into the battles which led to the liberation, for instance, of Ghana in 1957. 
and the gradual accomplishment of the goal set in 1900, when that year's Congress said the oppressed of the world, including the Africans, are bound to have a great influence upon the world in future. And the marching orders issued by the 1945 Fifth Pan-African Congress were contained in a clarion call entitled The Challenge to the Colonial Powers. And it said that the delegates to the Fifth Pan-African Congress believe in peace. How could it be otherwise when for centuries the African peoples have been victims of violence and slavery? Yet, if the Western world is still determined to rule mankind by force, then Africans, as a last resort, may have to appeal to force in the effort to achieve freedom, even if force destroys them and the world. And it said we are determined to be free. We want education. We want the right to earn a decent living the right to express our thoughts and emotions, to adopt and create forms of beauty. We demand for black Africa autonomy and independence so far and no further than it is possible in this one world for groups and peoples to rule themselves subject to inevitable world unity and federation. And it said we're not ashamed to have been an age-long patient people. We continue willingly to sacrifice and strive, but we are unwilling to starve any longer while doing the world's drudgery in order to support, by our poverty and ignorance, a false aristocracy and a discredited imperialism. And it said we condone, condemn the monopoly of capital and the rule of private wealth and industry for private profit alone. We welcome economic democracy as the only real democracy. And therefore, we shall complain, appeal, and arraign. <coughs> we'll make the world listen to the facts of our condition. We'll fight in every way we can for freedom for democracy and social betterment. I'd like to believe that all of us will have heard the voice of the young Kenneth David Kaunda as we listen to what the Fifth Pan-African Congress said in 1945 in its challenge to the colonial powers. I'm talking here about Kenneth Kaunda as he played a leading role in the historic organizations of the Zambian struggle for liberation from colonial rule, the Northern Rhodesia African National Congress, the Zambian African National Congress, and the United National Independence Party, UNIP, and led the Cha 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 Civil Disobedience Campaign. It is an established fact, historical fact, that the struggle for the total liberation of Africa from colonialism and apartheid <coughs> was hardest in our region of Southern Africa, and of course in Algeria and Kenya as well. The reason for this is easy to identify. It is simply settler colonialism. As all of us know, there was a large settler French settler population in Algeria, which then left Algeria as the French government considered to the demand of the Algerian people, led by the FLN, for independence. And though it was not expelled by liberated Algeria, the French settler population fled back to France because it feared the wrath of the Algerian people, having waged a brutal war against them to perpetuate colonial domination. In Kenya, the Mau Mau also engaged in a bitter struggle, in part to regain the land the people had lost through dispossession, land dispossession by the British settler population. 
and many of those also left after Kenya won its independence. But as we all know, in Southern Africa, settler colonialism was most manifest and had the greatest impact in South Africa, in Zimbabwe, in Namibia, in Angola, in Mozambique. And so let me speak briefly about South Africa in this regard. As we engaged in struggle to defeat the apartheid regime, we characterized the settler colonialism as colonialism of, of a special type. Special because the settlers exercised power in their own name, not some foreign colonial power. Essentially, this indicated how entrenched were the settlers in our country and how determined they were to make South Africa their permanent home. And as an expression of this, and as all of us know, they ensured that the indigenous African population was stripped entirely of any rights, that even in law, that black majority was treated as being subhuman, that that majority was stripped of all productive property, including land, to ensure that it is available to the white economy as cheap labor. It ensured that they, the settlers, would have the forces and the strength to support, suppress any rebellion by the majority. And that similarly, they have the possibility to defeat any external attempt to support the struggle for the, of the black oppressed for liberation. And therefore that they would have the means to ensure that they remain in power in perpetuity. And as we can imagine, and indeed as we know from experience, this was a setting which spoke of the inevitability of the most terrible violence which the apartheid regime would visit on the ANC and the struggling masses, as well as and especially the region of Southern Africa, which supported the struggle to end apartheid and therefore white settler minority domination. I'm certain you know why I've taken this small detour, this detour to talk about the phenomenon of settler colonialism in our region and continent and its impact. I've done this because, as you know, KK left an indelible imprint on what became a successful struggle to realize the historic achievement of the total liberation of Africa from colonialism and apartheid. In my detour, I've tried to emphasize the point that this struggle, particularly in our region, would demand great sacrifices on the part of the oppressed but struggling masses. At the same time, it would require that these masses and their liberation movements should do their best to secure dependable allies for themselves especially in our region and the rest of Africa. And let me mention some relevant dates uh, in this regard. The ANC in South Africa and the MPLA in Angola started engaging in armed struggle in 1961. Zapo in Zimbabwe and Frelimo in Mozambique followed in 1962. Zanu of Zimbabwe was next in 1965, followed by Swapo of Namibia in 1966. It was into these circumstances that independent Zambia was born in October 1964, and in which it spent in what could be called its, in, its formative first two years, circumstances of a region in which the liberation movements had launched the strategic offensive finally to defeat and remove the colonial apartheid regimes. Here I must also mention that all of us of course know that the Smith regime in Rhodesia <coughs> announced its universal declaration of independence in November 1965, confirming the determination of the colonial and apartheid regimes in the region, in the region to fight to the end. 
And as we all know, independent Zambia, despite all of that, despite being surrounded by these armed conflicts, independent Zambia, led by President Kenneth Kaunda, opened its doors to all the liberation movements. Yeah. And undoubtedly, the Smith and other white minority regimes in our region, without exception, would have said of independent Zambia, a friend of my enemy is my enemy. In this connection, I'd like to jump some years and quote some important words uttered by President Kaunda in an interview in 2008. And I should say, dear friends, that this, I thought these words were very important. I thought, therefore, I should allow President Kaunda to speak in his own words. And he said, we were not fighting for the independence of Zambia, of Northern Rhodesia to become Zambia not only fighting for the independence of Zambia. We were also very much concerned with seeing to it that our neighbors in the region also became independent. <coughs> Angola west of us, <coughs> Mozambique east of us, Zimbabwe south of us, Namibia, and of course South Africa itself. These were being run by colonialists, settlers, Apartheid elements in society, people who did not believe that God, that people of all races were God's children. People who believed that they were put on earth by God. They formed churches which were only for whites and blacks could not go there. It was openly apartheid. It was there in South Africa, it was there in Zimbabwe. It was there in Angola, in Mozambique. We decided that we had no right to say that Zambia is independent. We had to do what that great son of Africa, Julius Nyerere in Tanganyika, was doing. Julius Nyerere brought in all liberation movements from these countries and gave them liberation centers in Dar es Salaam, the capital of Tanzania. We ourselves were there. The Zambians were there. We had our offices there. As soon as we became independent, it was our duty now to do what Julius Nyerere had been doing. We opened our doors, and all liberation movements moved from Tanzania to Zambia. And that meant we were bombed from time to time by South African warplanes, Rhodesia, the Portuguese in Angola, the Portuguese in Mozambique, the settlers in Namibia, all these were now attacking Zambia because they wanted us to fear, to fear that accommodating liberation movements meant being bombed, bridges being destroyed. You build, they bomb. They bomb them again and again and so on. The place where you hide your oil, they come to bomb and destroy those. This is what life for us was. But it was something we had to do. When God says, love thy neighbor as thyself, do unto others as you want them to do to you, there is no choice there. We understood that and we accepted it. We went together and I remember one good missionary who wrote a book about my humble self, and he asked President Nyerere to put in an introduction. And uh, President Nyerere said in this introduction, if Kenneth Kaunda and the people of Zambia had decided that it was too difficult, like the late Dr. Banda of, Man of Malawi had done, and would not participate in the struggle, President Nyerere wrote, we would have understood. We would have understood that this was the right thing for him and the people of Zambia to do. But said President Nyerere, they went ahead with what they were doing in terms of uh, supporting that liberation struggle. 
So President Kaunda said, so you can see that all around, people understood the situation and were realistic enough to make the point that it was a very difficult situation. But we were, we were committed. It's the right of all God's children that all people should be free from oppression by other people. And he said, and today it is wonderful to be able to say, yes, we suffered, but the price was worth it. <laughs> Everybody now is free. Yes, people are making mistakes, but they are our mistakes by these governments, not mistakes made by foreign governments for us. We are happy with what we did. Yeah. I'm indeed very, very glad that I've had this opportunity to let KK speak for himself. For himself, as well as the government and people of Zambia, with regard to their role and place in the historic struggle for the final and decisive push to end colonial and apartheid domination in our continent. And for those of us who know firsthand what President Kaunda and all Zambia did, to help us achieve our freedom. It was indeed very moving to hear KK's own words. And today it's wonderful to be able to say, yes, we suffered, but the price was worth it. So we're happy with what we did. <clears throat> with your permission, let me relate some instances of the important support we received from KK as we engaged in struggle to defeat the apartheid regime. Halfway through the 1980s, a United States bank sent shockwaves through the apartheid system by refusing to roll, roll over its loans to that regime, demanding immediate payment. This marked a sharp intensification of the international economic sanctions against apartheid South Africa, and therefore a further advance of the liberation struggle. One of the results of this was that the demand grew particularly among the white elite in South Africa, that the time had come to talk to the ANC to seek an end to the apartheid system. And naturally, the apartheid regime was strongly opposed to the very idea of what was now called talking to the ANC. But big white business was the first to defy the apartheid regime in this regard. Accordingly, an important delegation of business traveled here to Lusaka uh, to talk to the ANC. Our president, Oliver Tambo, had mentioned to President Kaunda that the, the business request to meet with the ANC. And the president, President Kaunda, agreed that the meeting should take place in Zambia. He offered to host the meeting at Mfue Lodge in the Luangwa Game Park, and he arranged flights to take both delegations from Lusaka to Mfue and back. And he accompanied the delegations to Mfue in person and sat in at the meeting merely as an observer which assisted enormously to highlight the importance of that meeting. That business, that visit by business to meet the ANC in Zambia in 1985, opened the way for more delegations to visit, Lusaka, to visit the ANC, both in Lusaka and elsewhere in Africa and the rest of the world. The critical outcome of that process of talking to the ANC it resulted in ensuring that by the time the regime lifted the ban on the ANC in 1990, we had succeeded to rally around the broad objectives of the ANC, the majority of the leadership of our country, black and white, and thus further weakened the regime by deepening its domestic isolation. This was a strategic outcome of the process which started at the Mfue launch in 1985. 
hosted by our great leader, KK. We indeed were very happy that we could inflict yet another defeat on the apartheid regime with regard to that meeting at Mfue launch by informing our people in South Africa directly about what had been discussed. I say this because understanding the need for the ANC constantly to communicate to the oppressed in South Africa, President Kaunda had authorized that the then ZBS, the Zambia Broadcasting Service, should give us space to make radio broadcasts to South Africa every day. And our daily signature tune, introducing our broadcast, said, said, this is Radio Freedom. The voice of the African National Congress and Umkondo Wisizwe coming to you from Lusaka, Zambia. So every day in the week, this message went to South Africa from Lusaka, Zambia. And as KK had foreseen, <laughs> and as KK had foreseen, Radio Freedom became a very powerful tool a tool of our liberation movement in terms both of helping, helping to mobilize the masses of our people and strengthening the unity of these fighting masses around a common agenda. <coughs> Whatever the futile efforts, <coughs> pardon me, made by the apartheid regime to jam it, Radio Freedom made an important contribution to the ultimate victory of our liberation movements. As our liberation struggle made further advances, especially during the 1980s, the apartheid regime grew more, more desperate and worked to assassinate more of our leaders. And this meant, among others, that we had to strengthen the security around President Oliver Tambo. One of the things we did was to request many of our Zambian friends secretly to accommodate President Tambo for two to three days at a time. And that's to ensure that the enemy would not know where he was staying on any particular day. We were very greatly moved that not even once, not once, did any of our Zambian friends decline our request. <clears throat> They all agreed and hosted Oliver Tambo knowing very well that they might become victims of apartheid terrorism if the apartheid killers found out where their enemy, Oliver Tambo, was staying. In time, President Kaunda heard about this, about what his fellow Zambians were doing to help us, the ANC, to protect Oliver Tambo. He intervened as Gabriel Banda has just said, and allocated a house and home to Oliver Tambo, located within the grounds of State House. <laughs> and this meant that during the evenings, when the apartheid assassins would normally carry out their operations, their operations, the Zambian security organs would be responsible for Oliver Tambo's safety. Very regrettably, very regrettably, Oliver Tambo suffered from a heavy stroke during 1989 while he was working at his desk at the ANC headquarters here in Lusaka. The ANC immediately moved him to Lusaka Teaching Hospital and informed President Kaunda. And acting on the advice of the doctors, KK immediately arranged for a plane to fly over to London and ensured that he was accommodated in a hospital in London, appointed by Oliver Tambo's wife, Mrs. Adelaide Tambo, who was resident in London at the time. <coughs> and that speedy intervention by President Kaunda created the possibility for O.R. Oliver Tambo to receive the appropriate medical attention in the UK and Sweden, such that though afflicted by a partial disability, he was able to return to South Africa 
after the unburning of the ANC. And happily, he was able, Oliver Tambo, to deliver the opening presidential address at the very first African National Congress conference after its unburning, that was in 1991. And that conference, that conference elected him as the national chairperson of the ANC, a post he held until he passed away in 1993. In the revolutionary memory, it is not possible to separate these two African giants, KK and Owar, recalling that they were to each other more than mere comrades in arms. But during the same year that he suffered a stroke in 1989, President Tambo informed KK that such was the impact of the multifaceted offensive against the apartheid regime that sooner rather than later, the regime would seek to engage the ANC in negotiations. And Orr proposed to KK in this regard that it would be strategically advisable that the ANC prepares a roadmap on negotiations which should guide such negotiations whenever their time came. <clears throat> and KK agreed to this. And together they agreed that such a document should be discussed and agreed with the frontline states and then put to the African Union for its endorsement. And after that effort, would, after that, efforts would be made to get it approved by the United Nations General Assembly. Thus would it carry the required weight to provide the framework for the negotiations. And practically, this is what happened. We prepared the first draft of the negotiations document and discussed it with President Kaunda. He then gave President Tambo a business chat to enable him to fly with a small delegation to consult the other heads of state, the heads of the other frontline states. And Oliver Tambo therefore visited Tanzania, Zambia, you know, Tanzania, Zimbabwe, Botswana, and Angola, where before returning to Zambia. This took about a week thanks to the plane kindly provided by President Kaunda. That delegation led by Oliver Tambo amended the negotiations document to accommodate proposals made by the different heads of state as a delegation visited the various capitals. The delegation then met President Kaunda and briefed him on the amended document. And after studying the document and discussing with Oliver Tambo, he made his own observations, which were then incorporated in the document. Of course, the ANC forwarded the document to Mozambique and requested the comments of President uh, Chisano, which he sent. The ANC presented the finalized document to the fully mandated OAU and our Committee on Affairs of State on Southern Africa which met in Harare in 1989. The committee adopted the document on behalf of the OAU and entitled it the Harare Declaration, Declaration of the OAU Ad Hoc Committee on Southern Africa on the question of South Africa. And later the declaration was adopted by the United Nations General Assembly with a few slight amendments. And indeed, it then played an important role in framing the negotiations which officially began in South Africa with the Convention for a Democratic South Africa in December 1991. And thus, yet again, we warmly associate this historic new beginning with our dear leader, President Kenneth Kaunda. It marked yet, an, yet another defeat of the negative forces in our region, which had defined Zambia as their enemy. 
And in this regard, I must mention a meeting of the frontline states on the Nkomati Accord, which the government of Mozambique and the apartheid regime signed on the 16th of March, 1984. That frontline states meeting was held in Arusha, Arusha in Tanzania on the 29th of April, 1984. I'm certain that many of us here will recall that one of the major elements of the Ngomati Accord was that the government of Mozambique would not allow the ANC to operate from that country. And in return, the regime promised that it would stop supporting its instrument, RENAMO. <laughs> the frontline states met because they were very concerned that independent Mozambique had agreed with the apartheid regime to prohibit the ANC from using the country to continue the struggle against the apartheid crime against humanity. And by the time they met, by the time the frontline states met, six weeks after the signing of the accord, they had seen the departure from Mozambique of many ANC members. When he spoke at this meeting, uh, President Kaunda talked about a confidential agreement between himself and President Nyerere. He reported that he and Mwalimu had an agreement that, he would never, that they would never allow the situation to arise where their two countries would have to appeal to the IMF and the World Bank for help. He said that, nevertheless, the reality was that, in his words, quote, I have betrayed Mwalimu, unquote. He said that even as he was speaking, there was an IMF representative at the Minister of Finance in Lusaka. Now the government could not take any important decision on the economy without consulting the IMF representative to seek his agreement. President Kaunda described this as a defeat for Zambia and for himself and said they had to act to reverse it. President Kaunda used this story to argue that the frontline states and the liberation movements must accept that during the continuing struggle they would suffer temporary defeats. But what was important was that they must assume collective ownership of these defeats and take collective action to reverse them. And together they must declare that victory is certain. And indeed, indeed, thanks to all of those words, contrary to the expectations of the Pretoria regime, when it co coerced Mozambique to sign the Ngomati Accord, Mozambique played a sustained and critical role in the struggle for the liberation of South Africa, fully supporting the ANC. Once again, KK had risen to the challenge posed by a temporary defeat to underline the obligation of independent Africa to be ready to make the necessary sacrifices for the liberation of Africans, of all Africans, to be loyal to the Pan-Africanist cause and to expect no easy victories. Program director, because of what President Kaunda meant, not only to the ANC, but also the masses of our people, we were very sad when we received unhappy pieces of news about him some years later, after UNIP lost the 1991 elections. Unable to stand by as we heard this news, at some point we requested the late President Frederick Chuluma to receive an ANC delegation here in Lusaka, and fortunately he agreed. We sent a delegation here made up of the late Joe Mudise, head of our army, our People's Army, and James Mutlatsi at the time president of the South African National Union of Mine Workers, who knew President Chaluba as a former fellow trade unionist. 
And one of the humble requests our tele delegation made was that the president should kindly use his good offices to ensure that President Kaunda was properly accommodated in a house he would own and which would befit his status as a former president of Zambia and an outstanding African statesman. Yeah. In 2002, when we were in government in South Africa, we admitted President Kaunda into the order of the companions of our Tambo in gold. Our country's highest award, awarded to non-South Africans who have distinguished themselves as friends and supporters of the people of South Africa. And further, very concerned that KK should have the possibility to write what would be very important memoirs, we set aside one of the houses in Pretoria owned by the government for him to utilize. The house, the house had the necessary staff, including required security personnel, and would be fully supported by the government with regard to President Kaunda's needs. And indeed for him, this could be a home away from home where he would do this, this work. I'm very, very glad, I was very, very glad indeed to, to hear this evening that the memoirs are done and the process of publishing those memoirs is on course. <laughs> As I began this lecture, I cited an obituary published in a Nigerian newspaper, which among others described President Kaunda as the last African liberation giant. And we fully agree with this assessment. KK was a giant in many ways. He was one of the giants in the struggle for the liberation of Africa. He was a giant as a man of principle of high values of integrity and integrity. He was a giant in his respect for the truth. He was a giant also in his love for the people and his commitment to serve their interests. Inspired both by Christian teachings and his devotion to Zambian humanism. The book, A Humanist in Africa, by Kenneth Kaunda, Kenneth D. Kanuk Kaunda, was published by Longman's Green, a publisher in London, in 1966. <clears throat> One reviewer of the book, W. H. Crane, wrote, quote, some readers might find President Kaunda too optimistic and uncritical in his judgment of traditional African values and too negative in his appreciation of Western values. But after the years in which traditional African values have been violated by the colonialists, it is time for the balance to be redressed. And he said the Africans and African society could have no more worthy champion than the president of Zambia. <coughs> And many years after this correct tribute was published, in 1990, yeah, our Secretary General, the late Alfred Nzo, informed President Kaunda that we had agreed with the apartheid regime that after the unbending of the ANC and other political organizations and other changes, we would return home to begin the negotiations visualized in the Harare Declaration. President Kaunda was indeed very happy to hear this news and asked that our Secretary General should keep him informed about all further developments. And ultimately, Secretary General Zhou informed President Kaunda that he would lead a senior ANC delegation back to South Africa on the 28th of April, 1990 flying out of Lusaka. <clears throat> 
the delegation would join Nelson Mandela and other leaders at home for the first session of negotiations between the ANC and the regime, scheduled to take place during the 2nd to the 4th of May of 1990. Secretary General Nzo told the President Kaunda that the regime would send a plane to collect the ANC delegation. The words spoken then by President Kaunda have remained etched on our memories ever since. He said the return to South Africa of the senior leaders of the ANC, originating from the headquarters of the movement in Lusaka, was an important and historic moment, especially as the mission of these leaders was to secure the liberation of South Africa from apartheid tyranny. He said that it was vital that even as the delegation landed on South African soil, it must demonstrate that the ANC is a sovereign political formation and were the representative of the people which sought no support or assistance from the apartheid regime. <laughs> He said it would therefore be strategically wrong for the ANC headquarters delegation to, to arrive in, in South Africa, transported by a plane supplied by the apartheid regime, and insisted that the ANC delegation had to arrive in South Africa flying on its own wings. It was a Zambia Airways plane It was a Zambia Airways plane which carried us out of the then Lusaka International Airport, now the Kenneth Kaunda International Airport, and brought us safely to what was called the DF Malan Airport in Cape Town, and now the Cape Town International Airport. And all of us who flew on that Zambia Airways plane on that April day in 1990, kept reminding ourselves that we and all our comrades had a task never, never to disappoint our very dear leader, KK, and the sister people of Zambia, who had received and hosted us with unequaled warmth and comradeship. <laughs> uh, a decade before this, before our return to South Africa in 1990, after the independence of Zimbabwe, KK began to sing Tiwoloke Limpopo Dimtima Umu. And indeed, we crossed the Limpopo. And thank you very much. <laughs>